Hey everyone, welcome to the New Stacks Virtual Pancake Breakfast. We couldn't get together in Amsterdam, so here we are virtually having a conversation on cloud security in the distributed DevOps world. I am joined today by Carla Arn of IDC. Hi, Carla. Hello. We also have joining us Cheryl Hung of the CNCF. Hey, Cheryl. Hi, Alex. Good to be back with the new stack. Thank you so much for joining us. And John Morello of Palo Alto Networks. Hey, Alex. Hey, hey. I want to give a big shout out to Palo Alto Networks for sponsoring this pancake breakfast. And I, I, I'm actually able to have some pancakes today. Hey, John, can you do me a favor? Can you, can you pass me the syrup? I, yeah, I have a jar of syrup here. I'm going to hand it to you over here. There you oh, go. thank you so much for that syrup. I appreciate it. Now, does someone have any butter? Like, uh, maybe Cheryl, do you have any butter over there? Well, what a coincidence, Alex. I just happened completely by accident to have some butter right here. Oh, that is so. Oh, thank you very much for the butter. I so appreciate it. I'm going to put a little butter on my pancakes here. I'm going to then... Okay, yum, yum, yum. And I'm going to add a little syrup here. So thank you all. Oh, and Cheryl, I mean, Carla, do you do you have something? Can I pass you the syrup? Yes, please. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, you know, you can have some, great, you can have some pancakes later if you're not having them now. Thank you. Okay, that's delicious. I'm going to just try... I, I'm look at this. I'm like loving this. Oh, yum, 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 yum. I'm gonna just take a quick little bite just to enjoy them. So thanks for all your. Oh. Those do look like great pancakes. That's delicious. Thank you. Oh, well, that's so much fun. I think what I just have to say is thanks to the chef who did the job making those wonderful pancakes, mixed them all up, got the ingredients together, even though mine are vegan. And then pancake bonus. Hey, this has been, this is a great way to start the, start the event. Again, I want to thank everyone for being here. And I want to thank particularly Palo Alto Networks. And so, what I really want to talk about is cloud native security in the distributed DevOps world. And it's a background. We have worldwide events going on, which no one is spared. And it's really creating some changes in how we think about building, deploying, and managing at scale architectures. And with this new, reality, this new reality that we find ourselves in, we really are finding kind of a, a new kind of complexity that is emerging. One thing I did not do, though, before we get started is I didn't introduce Job Jackson. Is Job here? There he is. Job Jackson, Managing Editor. I love your hat, Job. Hello. Yes. Here I am. Thank you, Thank you for joining us. What's mm -hmm. your favorite pancake, Job? Are you like a sa buttermilk sourdough? Uh, I tell you the truth. Uh, I'm more, you know, my favorite pancakes are diner pancakes. The local diner here, Tina's, uh, it's across from the Boar's Head Meat Processing Facility. They got the shift workers come in, and I, uh, I show up and I say, "Give me a stack of pancakes." I don't even order, order off the menu. Give me a stack of pancakes and some bacon and some eggs, and boom, it's there. Diner pancakes are my pick. That's a nice that 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 that's New York living. I'll tell you right there. Especially yeah, the back in the days, we could go out and go to a diner too. 
Great. Well, I did was remiss in not introducing you, Job. Job's going to be asking the questions that we pulled in from Twitter and some other sources. So Job is here to present those. So I just want to get started with a quick question. I'm really wanting to look at how we're going to be coming out strengthened from this time that we're in. And I'm curious, and maybe we'll start with you, Carla. What are you finding customers doing right now? How are they looking to strengthen their position coming out of this, you know, this, this difficult time that we're in? Right. Um, what we are seeing is that that customers are currently focusing on um, on projects that help them uh, to ensure their business resiliency and business continuity, and that is the first priority. But what we are also seeing is that customers who have already been on a digital journey and have gotten quite far on this digital journey, they are actually um, getting much better through this crisis than um, customers who were just at the very beginning of their digital journeys. Mm -hmm. And these journeys also include the cloud. So if they had a cloud strategy already and they had a lot of cloud enabled, then um, they, it was easier for them to make the switch, for example, to remote working and to remotely running their businesses rather than organizations who were still very much uh, bound in, in the physical world by, by physical shops or physical production lines. So, um, so there is this um, immediate need to, to look at business continuity. But what we are also seeing is as we are um, getting through this crisis, then um, towards the end, we see organizations really focusing on innovation because now is actually also a great time to look at, uh, at digital innovation because uh, the crisis has almost given organizations the to-do list of where they are behind in terms of digital implementing digital. That's really helpful. And so, John, when you think of innovation, what do you think of? What are some of those innovative things that are emerging, you know, from, from your point of view of Prisma, of the Prisma, from the Prisma Cloud perspective? Well, I, I think what we what we have been seeing from customers over the past, I guess, six weeks or so now, of this uh, has been that that a lot of the reasons that people were adopting cloud native architectures are just as relevant and potentially even more relevant now in the economic situation that we have, because the things that that people were driving people towards containers were not just because of the technical coolness of containers and Kubernetes. It was because they wanted to continue to be an innovative software-driven organization, regardless of whether they were a software company or they, you know, were a manufacturer, a government, whatever. I mean, everybody still wants to have that competency of like creating digital experiences for their users, their constituents, and so forth. And that's even more important now, I think, when, when people in many cases don't have a choice to interact with you in a physical way. And so the tools that enable that digital transformation really are cloud native. I mean, it's containers and Kubernetes and all the, the rest of the ecosystem around that. So we, at least so far, haven't really seen people changing from, you know, like, like de delaying or, or turning those plans off simply because these are the kinds of things that will allow them to not only come out of this whole thing stronger, but actually allow them to continue to have some kind of business as, as it transpires. So um, right now, I would say it's, it's more about the focus, if anything, is more about how do you consolidate on that? How do you reduce the complexity of your environment? How do you operate more efficiently with more automation? And again, it's the same tools around Kubernetes and containers and so forth that really enable that efficiency of operations. What are customers coming and asking about, Cheryl? What are what is the ecosystem asking about now? What is it the what what has been the reaction from from your community? Uh, to how they can, you know, prepare themselves, how they can cope with what's going on. So very similar to what John has seen, in fact. So we ran a CNCF survey around the end of last year, the end of 2019, and asked people, why do you actually adopt containers and Kubernetes? And the top three benefits that people said were availability, the ability to run services 24 seven with very little downtime, scalability, the ability to scale services up and down as they're needed, and then the ability to do faster deployments. And this is exactly what people need at this time. Uh, to give you an example, Slack put a great list of information out about uh, around the end of March when everybody was just transitioning to working from home. And Slack was seeing this absolutely enormous increase in demand. And one of the reasons that their platform could cope with this was because they'd architected it in a cloud native way 
so that it could scale up and down as needed and yet maintain the the availability and the flexibility for that engineering team. Hi, Carla. I, I, I'm thinking about this, and you mentioned that you know, you're seeing the ones that are better off or the ones who've been prepared. Uh, Hubert, we're thinking about this a while ago. Um, and then there's the new ones who are just starting to really kind of like realize they really have to get on get on board here. Are they are they talking about security? Are they asking about security questions? Is that a first question that they ask about? What is it what is it as a priority for them? Yeah, security is definitely um, the top priority because as we've all transitioned into this remote working environment, um, it also became very obvious that uh, the the security architectures have not been laid out to this uh, remote working at scale. And uh, so we've seen a lot of security incidents and consequently customers are asking a lot about, um, you know, what should they do about security? How can they um, ensure that uh, their employees are safe, the data is safe um, and they can operate uh, their business in a secure way? So, th so that's really the number one priority. Huh. So, John, when you hear that, like what what are the threats that you're seeing that are affecting people? What are what, are, what threats are affecting developers and distributed DevOps teams right now? And what are, so what are security ops centers in particular doing to enable development of microservices in this new, you know, you know, in this new security theater that we face? Well, unfortunately, as I also learned after Katrina 15 years ago, the, uh, when you have a, a crisis like this, it tends to bring out both the, uh, the best and the worst aspects of humanity, and the, the worst in this case being um, there's there's been an increase in the level of attacks uh, against organizations that are very much impacted and involved with the whole response to it, like hospitals, for example. Uh, and the reason why hospitals are a good target, you know, if you're an attacker at least, a good target for you is you you know that already they're they're very much overwhelmed. They're they're operating you know outside the bounds of normalcy already. Uh, and so because of that, you know, it's more likely that you'd be able to kind of sneak things through and get them to do things that, um, you know, maybe they wouldn't ordinarily be able to be uh, compromised through. So I don't know that there's, there's really been specific threats that are, you know, container specific or Kubernetes specific. But anytime you have a crisis like this and, and chaos that, that ensues from it, you see the, you know, the, the uh, kind of the, the evildoers, the bad actors, whatever you want to call them. Uh, tend to take advantage of that chaos to try to really attack those organizations that are that are most uh, thrown up in it. So, you know, for for us, we had lots have lots of customers in, in governmental space and in healthcare, uh, and from all of them, what we've seen is that they they've noticed an increase in the number of attacks that they've been under. And, you know, not specific to containers, not specific to Kubernetes, but just overall phishing attacks. The kinds of the kinds of like background noise that everybody experiences is only heightened during all this because again. If you're a bad actor, you realize that there's chaos and chaos is an opportunity for you to capitalize and probably sneak things in that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So, uh, you know, to the point earlier, I think being able to make sure that you've got that security posture built in from development all the way through production uh, continues to be even more important now because of that increased risk that you're under. So when you talk about optimizing your cloud environment for security, for your security op centers, you know, what are, you know, what are customers asking about and, and, and what are you telling them about how they can just think about this, especially with the chaos ensuing? I mean, the, the, one of the focus that we've always had in the product is to not force people to uh, go to our interface, to use our product UI as the way that they understand the threats and the risks and the vulnerabilities that they're exposed to. You know, we really invest in having a great user experience, of course, but we also realize that most organizations have 20 plus years investment in, in SIM tools and security automation and other alerting channels. And so we really try to make sure that everything that we have in the product is accessible through whatever channels you're already utilizing your environment. So everything that we have, we output in standard RFC compliant syslog. You can get it via our API and just an open JSON or CSV format. We integrate with all kinds of, of third party alerting providers like uh, PagerDuty and Jira and Slack and so forth. And really, I think the, the most important thing with, when you talk about any security platform, not just what we do with Twistlock or, or, or excuse me, for the cloud compute, but just in, in general, anything that you're talking about, it's, I think typically the individual features 
in that security platform are less important than the ability for you to efficiently integrate it with your overall operations. You could have a great set of security features, but if it's not something that you can operationalize, it doesn't really help you. Whereas if you have a more foundational set of features, but you can actually make use of them and integrate them into your day-to-day operations, you're going to get greater value from that. Now, of course, we want to have the best features and also make it easy to to integrate and and operationalize. Um, But I think that the real answer to your question, Alex, is to to make sure that the tools, the data, the knowledge that your security tool has is not siloed in that place, but that you make it available and openly accessible to all the other frameworks and workflows you already have. Interesting. So, Cheryl, in the CNCF, security has been a much uh, larger focus, hasn't it? And I just want to just confirm that and then just also think about, you know, what are the projects that you think about now that might, you know, be thought about when we're thinking about these current times as well? Right. I mean, security has been a focus really from, from the beginning. So when you think of a container, you think of something that can be isolated. You think of something that is disposable, which means you can be more proactive about uh, removing older containers and deploying new images. And because it's stateless as well, you can have confidence that what you've actually deployed is what's actually running in production. So these things have been a very core part of why cloud native and containers have been a success from the very beginning. And then nowadays, I think the conversation has moved away from, you know, how do we just get started? How do we set up a cluster to, as John was saying, this more operational perspective. So what are all the things that we need to do in terms of making sure we're using uh, a minimal operating system and setting up our roles correctly and, uh, you know, if there is a if there is a an intrusion, then how do we set up our policies to detect and prevent those kind of intrusions? And some of the projects within CNCF that I think are really interesting to look out for at the moment, um, Falco, I really like. Falco is a one-time security product that continually scans what's happening and compares it with a set of policies so that you know what's what's in your system as it's running. And then for companies who are a bit further down the path of adopting, um, I think the TUF, the TUF, the update framework, and the project that that's based, that's based off that, which is called Notary, are really good ways of making sure that your, secu- your software supply chain are also secure. So you know what you are deploying and then what is actually running in production. That's a great list. Really appreciate that. Job, do we have a question from the virtual world out there? We do indeed. We got a a number of questions. Uh, First one up comes from uh, Anurig Gohol. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He's the founder and CEO of Render. And, uh, and he's asking that, uh, you know, in this distributed world of DevSecOps, uh, is uh, the Beyond Corp, the Google Beyond Corp, uh, I guess more formally known as the zero trust model of computing, the uh, clear winner? Or will you still have a, a role for traditional VPNs uh, in this uh, new cloud native environment? I would start- John, why don't you take that one? Sure, sure. I, I was going to say, like, I, I think that, that while there is some uh, loose relationship between remote access and VPN technologies and cloud native, it's probably not really the uh, the same space. I mean, cloud native is really about making the applications, you know, how you run and, and build and deploy your applications, whereas like the zero trust, at least, at least what Google refers to as, as the Beyond Corp model is really about how users access them. Now, they may access a cloud native application via kind of a Beyond Corp model where they don't have a traditional like layer two VPN, um, but I think those things are, are kind of largely separate. However, I will say that there is a lot of relevance to the notion of zero trust networking within cloud native applications in general. Uh, one of the things, for example, that we really recommended a lot in the NIST special pub 800-190 uh, around container security was around isolating workloads and their network traffic into 
kind of broad security domain. So, you know, if you have applications that service, you know, the public internet and things that work with your treasury and things that store, you know, health information about your patients, all those containers should not be running in the same Kubernetes cluster. They should be separate out into separate clusters and you should have the ability to implement a least privileged network model between them. Um, we do a lot of that work within Prisma Cloud Compute, um, you know, be the ability to automatically learn the network connections between, you know, my front end talks to my cache, but it doesn't talk to my payments database directly to show you what that looks like and then to actively enforce it. So while Beyond Corp specifically is focused on really the notion of in user access to resources, the notion of zero trust networking is very much related to what you do with, with cloud native, but really about protecting individual components of the application and being able to limit the blast radius. So again, in that example, if the front end is, is compromised, even if I fully own that front end container or, or pods that are running those containers, I still don't have the ability to send traffic directly to my payments database because we've learned that that's not the normal traffic flow. And you'd only be able to talk to the components of the application that you normally do. So if there is a compromise, the, the blast radius, so to speak, of that is uh, it's much more limited. So zero trust networking is relevant, probably just not directly the implementation that Google has with Beyond Corp, which is really focused more on end user access. You know, I was going to ask Carla a question about traditional security vendors and how they're thinking about the work that they've been doing them because a lot of your customers, I'm sure, have been working with traditional security vendors over the years. How are they thinking about that transition when they're thinking about the cloud? I mean, the, the network and the network security is, is one of the key areas that they are investigating. And what, um, what we are seeing here is it's a new area for many customers and they um, they need to understand it. And we have, um, at least in Europe where I'm based, we have a big skills problem here. Um, so the skills to, to move to these newer types of networking are not necessarily uh, readily available. So it is quite tough to make that transition, but they do understand that this is the way that they need to go because um, if they don't get uh, the network and the network security right, then um, it's hard to have a, a successful cloud implementation. They do understand DevOps though, correct? Are they starting to? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, they do. But uh, and they they have high ambitions. But again, um, you know, also DevOps engineers are in high demand and short supply. And um, and the challenge we see here is that um, the security is still brought in uh, too late in the process. Um, and we really talk a lot with them about shifting security left, and that they need to bring in security from the start. Uh, even you know the first before the first line of code is written, um, they should talk to the security and, um, uh, engineers, and they should do a, a risk assessment even of the concept of the application that they are doing. But uh, but very few organizations are are able to do that because they they still see um, or bring in the security um, folks as consultants rather than as as team members uh, that have that share the responsibility. So I think um, you know while there's a lot of uh, new technology coming into the market that that people need to come up to speed with, there's also the, um, just as big an organizational challenge that they need to overcome and they need to think about how they can organize their processes differently, their tools, uh, their uh, sorry, their DevOps teams differently and how they can make um, these uh, security professionals uh, true members of the DevOps teams. This must be a topic of discussion inside the CNCF ecosystem in terms of, you know, how that you, how you do enable DevOps to make it a process that people not just understand, but they can build security into it. I think, you know, there's any number of, you know, cloud native uh, projects out there, you know, there must be a conversation quite a bit on this topic. Cheryl. Um, actually, I think I see a little bit of what Carla is saying, which is that the engineers are gung ho about like, let's go deploy something. We can spin it up super quickly and we'll think about security later. Um, so while there's pockets of the ecosystem that are very security focused and very forward thinking, I would say perhaps we're not there in the, the general sort of mindset at the moment. But having said that, I myself was an engineer at Google for many years. And uh, apart from actually, John, as you were saying, Beyond Corp is, is probably not so relevant to how we build the applications. It, it's definitely an end user thing. 
I, as an engineer, never really had to think about security in a lot of detail. And I think that's probably the right approach because it's always going to be difficult to to sort of simultaneously train all members of your task force at the same time. So the best you can do is use good practices, like um, use namespaces well and minimize the access that people can have and, and properly audit what people are doing. And then to train the people as they go through that process, rather than trying to expect them to learn all of security upfront. That's that's a great kind of recap, I think, from from all of you. And I'd love to move into discussions about compliance and governance. And these are issues that have not have not traditionally been at the forefront of discussion. But now, as we move into questions about security, as we really get into questions about the data itself and how you secure it, these are now really fundamental questions that we're starting to hear about. And some. Really wondering from, you know, from your perspective, uh, Carla, let's start with you about this matter of compliance and governance, because a lot of the big companies that I know that IDC works with have lots of regulations that they have to think about. They have to think about, you know, how their development processes are integrating these really important policies. And I'm curious from a cloud security perspective, what are they thinking about? What are they talking about? Right. I mean, in Europe, uh, you know, we have uh, GDPR, so that has been a big headache for uh, for organizations for some years now. And um, but it also has um, helped organizations to become very compliance aware. So we are talking about um, security by default and by design, which is one of the um, the key. Um, mandates from GDPR um, that it puts on organizations. So, so compliance is, um, you know, is top of mind. Here in Europe, it has been one of the biggest inhibitors of cloud adoption, actually, because organizations weren't sure if they could actually comply properly if they are using the cloud and how they could do it uh, in the right way. I think we have come a long way where um, there is a growing maturity and understanding that um, uh, how to use the cloud in a compliant way. So we see greater adoption. And actually, um, COVID-19 has accelerated that um, as well, where a lot of the initial security and compliance concerns are um, subsiding a little bit because um, the, the need to, to move to the cloud is so big. But um, but it is definitely something that needs to be taken into account and it needs to be taken into account very early in the development process. So again, one of these things that um, that need to need to happen very early on. So John, when you're thinking about this and you're thinking about DevOps and DevOps in prior times, I'm not sure if it's relevant now, was considered almost a security threat. It was considered a, a uh, you know, a, a way that you didn't really want to work. And now DevOps is being seen as a way to mitigate security threats. How's that relevant now? How is that increasingly relevant now, kind of in the during the times that we face? Well, it's you know DevOps is a, a technology or a, a operational process that's that's neither good nor evil, right? I mean, you can you can do it well, you can do it poorly. If you do it well, you can take advantage of the of what it offers to, to have a better security posture in the end. If you do it poorly, you can end up with a worse situation. So, you know, like like uh, Cheryl was mentioning around cloud, or uh, you know, Carl was mentioning around cloud, the, the whole notion of uh, of DevOps kind of follow that same pattern. You know, when it first became popular, when containers, when cloud natives started to become popular, back in 2015, when we started Twitslock, that was a common question. You know, we I can't say how many articles were written about like, are containers secure and so forth. Um, honestly, we don't really see that question anymore these days. I mean, I think people realize that uh, it's a new technology pattern. There's different threats, there's different risk. It's neither better nor worse really, but it gives you the opportunity, I would say, and I say opportunity because it doesn't provide it just automatically, but it gives you the opportunity, I think, for the first time to really do security in a much more life cycle comprehensive manner. So, you know, in the past, the way that people would, do, would build an application, some developer built their app, they would uh, hand it over to some operations guy, that person would deploy it. 
you know, and then they would go and run, you know, Qualys or Tenable or whatever tool and they find vulnerabilities and they would they would patch those vulnerabilities. But largely the developer, once they ship their thing, it wasn't their problem anymore. Um, now, with the fact that you have the same artifact from build to test to deployment, not only are developers more responsible, but now you have the opportunity again to put security earlier in that life cycle. So, for example, one of the most popular parts of our product is the integration we have with the CI process, even back to like Git repos, to be able to find vulnerabilities every time you do a build and for you to be able to enforce security policy to say, you know, if this build contains, you know, higher critical vulnerabilities and developers have had more than 15 days to fix them, then fail the build, make them go and fix that problem there before it ever progresses out of development and, and towards production. Um, so again, it's the opportunity to do that better, but just, you know, just like with cloud, you know, adopting cloud doesn't make you magically more secure or, or less secure. It's the same thing with, with DevOps and cloud native. Like the technologies there allow you to do things in a more autonomous and complete way, but it's still up to the people and process part of the equation for you to really be able to capitalize on those opportunities. You know, I think of DevOps as core to being part of cloud native technologies, Cheryl. And but DevSecOps is a relatively new term, but I've actually heard it dated back to 2015, but still relatively new for a lot of people. How is it becoming more relevant now? I think you touched on that when you talked about some of these projects, but in consideration of you know this really new times we're facing, what is the importance of shift left in open source communities? Mm. So what I've seen is that companies ask, especially as the adoption progresses beyond the small, small number of clusters or small number of applications, as it expands to encompass all of the systems and applications they're running, security is becoming a bigger and bigger focus of this. So something that will work for a 20 person startup probably won't work for a huge multinational bank with 40 years worth of legacy infrastructure that they can't move all in one piece. So this does actually provide an opportunity to bring in some of the processes to build the processes in early and to also use some of the projects that are open source or within CNCF to enhance the security processes from the technical perspective. And then what I really am seeing at the moment, and I think is a really great trend, is that companies are, are pushing out these best practices to other organizations and collectively figuring out how's, what is the best way to protect and enhance the capabilities. That's interesting. Job, do we have another question? We certainly do. Uh, we have an interesting question from uh, Kevin Stump, uh, co-founder and CTO over at uh, Tekton AI. Tekton does uh, uh, data, offers a data platform for machine learning, and he was uh, curious about how much of an impact is uh, artificial intelligence slash machine learning currently having on cloud security solutions? Uh, is there a, is there a role for AI in uh, in uh, security uh, detection, remediation, and management? John, you guys remember the term cloud washing? The uh, the notion that that vendors I don't know five to ten years ago would just say everything is cloud enabled, even if it really wasn't. Uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of that's happened with uh, AI and ML, you know, maybe even more so because nobody really understands what it is, uh, or very few people do at least. Uh, and so there's a lot of vendors out there that do, you know, that, that talk a lot about artificial intelligence and machine learning and so forth um, to the point where I think a lot of people have been turned off, a lot of customers and, and users have been turned off by it because it's, it's a very in-specific term uh, and the implementations of it in many cases are, are just they're, they're not they're not really doing anything different than software may have been done five plus years ago. Um, that said, there are some real cases where it, it is applied. I mean, like, you know, we actually with our own product, we actually we do machine learning to create mo what we call models for for your uh, application. So as you deploy an image, uh, we learn what that image does over time. Uh, for example, the processes that it runs and kind of the process tree of parents that invoke them, file system activities and so forth. We create this four-dimensional model for what it does and look for anomalies relative to that. 
it's legitimate machine learning, but but because of what I was saying earlier, like I almost never talk about it in that context. I just talk about it as modeling because I think people have heard that term about machine learning and artificial intelligence so often now that uh, it really has lost a lot of its meaning. I think in a lot of places that you can see some, some opportunities for doing that are places where you have large aggregate amounts of data and you can apply patterns to look for anomalies in that data without having to create explicit rules. So, you know, one kind of canonical use case of that is if you're a cloud provider, if you're you know, Azure, for example, you can use AI, ML techniques to be able to identify when you have anomalous activities with logging. You know, for example, without me having to create a rule, the system can learn that, you know, generally John logs into this application from, you know, this geographic region during these times of day you know, and be able to determine without somebody having to manually program what that looks like uh, if there is an anomaly because I start logging in at some very odd time and accessing different applications and trying to do privileged operations with them in places from which I don't normally log in. So there are some opportunities for that, but but I would say, unfortunately, I think the industry has, uh, the marketing teams across the industry at least have, uh, have largely abused that term where uh, where it's become kind of a net negative to talk about because people have heard it so much and it, it lacks much real clarity today. That's my own opinion. Do customers get confused, Carla, at all? And how are, are they conflating AI with DevOps and are they conflating AI with DevOps and security? And But once you get beyond that, DevOps really is the real... Uh, realization in many ways of machine learning and it's really the that fine-grained um you know processes that you can develop by you know creating these loops that allow you to kind of see more and more and more distinctions in the data and be able to then automate it to some respect right but I'm curious from your perspective carlo how how you how you all view that I mean, I would say the, the maturity of, um, of understanding um, machine learning and AI, I agree, we are still at the beginning of this journey and, um, you know, customers are still learning about how to apply it. But I think there is a big promise um, of applying uh, both machine learning and, and artificial intelligence to, to security and um, to, yeah, to automate a lot of the processes and help the, the systems and the machines decide that and, and to help us defend against uh, cyber attacks. So, mm -hmm. so I think there's a big promise there, but in terms of adoption, um, we are still in, uh, in early stages, but there's a lot of interest um, because uh, people can really see the potential that, that these technologies hold. So Cheryl, what are the technologists actually talking about in this respect? What are some of the conversations that, you know, that are surfacing in, in you know, in, in the community? Because machine learning is very, is quite viable and it's quite useful in many ways for, you know, automating issues. I think of custom resource, um, you know, definitions and, and automating a lot of the work that an operator might do, for instance, with Kubernetes operator models. And so, those are those are not always called machine learning or artificial intelligence, but they're a way of taking away a lot of the tasks that an operator might, you know, uh, be asked to do. So from the talks with people I've had in the community, my impression is that people are not quite there yet with the idea of machine learning as applied to security. I think there are a lot of low hanging fruits that can be adopted first, like things like um, like runtime security and, and scanning what, you're, what you've got deployed and making sure it's the correct thing. And I think that machine learning is more of an opportunity perhaps in a couple of years time rather than something that's actively happening now. As Carla said, there's definitely interest, but I have not seen any production scale deployments of it. Yet. Great. How about another question, Joe? Oh, sure thing. We have a, a question from Twitter from Ben Fisher, and uh, he had asked, what is or what are the best ways for an organization to transition to a DevSecOps model? Perhaps they already have DevOps and they want to and they want to uh, add security into it, or perhaps they're starting fresh, but they want to just have security baked in from the start. What are some general tips for getting started? John. 
I, I mean, I think there's two main themes that are relevant when you talk about DevSecOps. Um, one of them is, is really automation. Whatever the processes are that their security team is manually doing today, um, you know, be that notifying people about problems or, you know, checking code for deficiencies, whatever it may be, to automate those processes and to remove the human as much as possible from the equation. Um, that's kind of, to me, the, one of the first steps, if you want to you know, claim that you're really doing DevSecOps, if, if there's not automation involved with it, it's, it's hard, I think, to credibly say that that's what you're doing. The second piece I think it's key is, is an actual preventative aspect. So even if you're automating the checking of you know, an image or a function that's being built for vulnerabilities, if you're not automatically preventing things that do not meet your criteria from progressing through that life cycle, I'd also argue that you're not really integrating uh, security with DevOps. Um, so the first thing is, is really the, the automation of all the touch points that are manual today to try to make that as frictionless and as automated as possible. And secondly, to introduce preventative aspects as early in the life cycle and throughout the life cycle as possible. So, you know, if you're if somebody's building an application, they shouldn't be able to build that application if it doesn't meet your compliance objectives or your vulnerability requirements or something like that. Um, to me, those are the two staples, the, the automation of, of manual effort and the introduction of preventative measures throughout the life cycle of the application. Carla, what do you recommend to your clients? What we talk about is that also to bring in um, the security risk assessment at the very beginning, before, you know, at the very start of the project, actually, before the, the, the coding starts, um, and to, um, to already test the, the concepts. And then... Um, the other thing is also to to a little bit let go probably of uh, of the strict security and to accept that you can't fix all the problems uh, in the first version. You should of course fix all the major ones, um, but but some that are maybe not as uh, serious, they can maybe wait to the next uh, version release, which is. Uh, of course, following very quickly after, um, but but maybe take one step back from perfectionism as well. Um, I mean, we all want to have the most secure applications possible, but um, but if you want to fix everything from the onset, then you probably are never going to launch your application. So there needs to be a trade-off as well here. Um, so these would be some some easy steps to start. But uh, but I mean, there's a long list of of tips, I guess. Yeah, Cheryl, prioritization is a, is a topic we hear a lot about uh, from technologists and the need for tools with better prioritization. And I'm curious in the open source communities out there, this must be a, a topic that people are discussing when they're thinking about DevOps and DevSecOps. What do you actually do you prioritize? Mm. I mean, if you've seen the CNCF landscape with the probably thousand plus products and projects on it, then you'll definitely agree that there's a need to prioritize. Unfortunately, it's actually very hard to say for a broad range of people what the correct solution is because there are so many options. What I would recommend is talk to people, go and find the, talk to some of the, the open source people, the maintainers, find the other people who are using projects and get their opinions and get their their recommendations as you go along, because this is not a, a fixed target, right? We're all learning together what these best practices are. And the technology change, changes so fast that if you're not in the community and talking to those people, you will fall behind. Yeah. That's what I'd recommend. Well, great. We're coming up toward the end of our show. And I do want to ask a few questions about the actual deployment uh, challenges that are facing people now, especially with everyone at home. And, you know, and, and tools like Slack, which have seen huge amounts of increase, as, as, as Cheryl was pointing out, uh, chat ops has become very, very popular. And all of these different ways to kind of think about securing the infrastructure are becoming more important. You know, such as using certificates and and API keys, and you know, and, and you know, and two-factor authentication, all kinds of different aspects of the new world we face are really coming to bear. So, John, I'm just curious from your point of view, what do you what are you saying to people when they're like moving into a kind of a world where there's so many more attacks? Have you talked about? There's so much more chaos. 
And but they still have to deploy and they have to deploy really quickly. They're using they're using chat ops, they're using Slack. What what do you say to them? Well, I mean, I think it's a lot of the things we've already talked about. I mean, the more that you can do to automate those flows and to not have humans involved. Well, so in, when you say automate, like, 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 like specifically, like, yeah, so for example, like, like, you know, if, if your typical flow for getting an application into production involves uh, some dude logging into uh, a node in the cluster and running kube cuddle commands to deploy that application, well, that's something that you should probably standardize and systematize and put into like a Jenkins or some similar tool to automate that process so that when it happens the next time, it's going to happen exactly like it did the time before. And you can build in all those kind of onerous, annoying steps that people don't like to deal with from a security standpoint and let software do it instead. You know, that's a simplistic example, but there's probably thousands of things that are like that in, in almost any customer. The, the kinds of steps that people are doing to build their application, to ship their application, to scale the application after it's been deployed, there's almost always opportunities to automate aspects of that that, that today are manual. You know, people don't like to be irritated with some of the things you talked about, like, you know, two-factor authentication and you know, all the other steps that are required really to do security well is not things that are necessarily good for a, an enjoyable user experience. However, if you can build automation around those manual tasks, then you can take not just the human out and, you know, avoid them from having to do something that's tedious, but you can actually make the process significantly more secure because you can build in those more heinous, onerous, onerous steps that they would have to do and just have that as part of the build job or, or the deployment job, whatever it is that's doing the work that you need to. So I think in, it's, you know, it's not a panacea and it requires upfront work to be able to do it. But in general, the more that you can automate, the more consistent you're going to be. And the more predictable the outcomes are going to be. And those are two aspects of doing security well is the consistency and the predictability. If you don't have those, it's really hard to do security in a way that's going to be comprehensive across a large environment. So you need the people, you need the processes, and then you need to have the right technologies for the individuals and the team members. Yeah, but I would say it's honestly, it's less about the technology. There's so much great open source stuff out there. There's so many great commercial distributions of this. I don't think hardly anyone is hurting for the technology. In, in almost all these cases, it's less about the technology and more about the people and process side. That's the piece that's more difficult. And one of the things I've always, you know, going back 20 years and doing consulting, I always told people, but it's a, a very true lesson is it's almost always easier and more efficient for you to adapt the way that you do business to fit the technology than it is for you to try to manhandle the technology into way, working the way that you happen to be doing business today. And that's even more true with things like Kubernetes and, and containers. I mean, even to this day, we see customers that still want to treat a container almost like some kind of miniature virtual machine, and they do it in a very manual basis, and they go in there and they change things after it's deployed, which is an example of them trying to make this new technology work the way that they want to, instead of simply saying like, this is a new way of doing things. There's benefits to that. If I kind of flush what I've been doing and saying, when I really embrace this new mechanism of working, I'll really reap the benefits of that much more quickly and also probably much more securely than I can if I try to retrofit that new technology into my old way of operating. Well, in conclusion, I'd love to get one more question. Joe, what do we have from you in hearing about what people are asking out there in the Twitterverse and everywhere else. All right. We uh, actually have a question from um, Saad Malik. He's a co-founder and CTO of Spectro Cloud. Uh, Spectro Cloud offers a, uh, uh, an enterprise uh, ready uh, service for Kubernetes. So uh, check them out. And uh, he wants to uh, talk about, uh, we bring it back a bit to COVID-19. And he asked, with well, everybody working at home now, what are the new attack vectors that uh, the malicious actors are using? Especially with, you know, the personal home devices, the home routers, uh, the home uh, PCs, uh, that might be easier to gain access to uh, company systems. Uh, using home uh, gear as a pivot point to get into the enterprise. What are people's thoughts on that? Oh, John, I think that's good for you. And then I'm going to go to Cheryl to see what projects are out there that she thinks about. Yeah, I, I, you know, while there are attacks against home network equipment and, and home routers and so forth, honestly, the, the, the most straightforward way to penetrate an organization today is still direct targeted phishing, spear phishing, so to speak, in, in the sense that you're going to uh, uniquely target 
certain individuals at an organization that you know from LinkedIn or wherever else that they happen to hold some, you know, some uh, privileged potentially role within the IT organization or what you often see now for just financial fraud purposes as somebody who works in the finance department or as a CEO or something. You know, things as simple as, as literally registering a domain name that, that uses internationalized characters that looks very similar to your actual domain name. You know, and, and pretending that you're the CEO and asking for somebody to transfer money to some account because you've got some, you know, emergency COVID related thing that's going on, which is an example of trying to take advantage of that chaos like we talked about earlier. So, well, yeah, I mean, you don't want to have, a, you know, an insecure home router and so forth. Really, the, the most likely way that most organizations are compromised in a significant manner is by, by getting someone to run untrusted software on some endpoint that has access to manage their environment or access to whatever system it is that they want to compromise. And usually the, the way to do that most easily is not through like trying to figure out how they access the internet from home, but just targeting whatever devices and systems that they're using day to day, even from their work laptop, even in like a you know secure network location that, that their employer provides, you know, you still see those attacks succeeding. And I don't think that that, you know, the fact that people are working from home really changes that equation. That's still kind of the softest underbelly that you can target. Mm -hmm. So Cheryl, there, yeah. the CNCF is moving deeper into the world of nodes and devices and thinking beyond just the data center as a node. What is your take on this question? Um, Definitely, there's a lot more emphasis now on edge computing and running Kubernetes and containers at the edge. I kind of agree with John that just in this particular situation, there is there will be some impact, but it's not something that can be fixed by just deploying a project or a new tool. It still comes back to, you know, set up your clusters correctly, practice good security hygiene, um, be preventative about and proactive. And then if there are intrusions, make sure you're monitoring and alerting and aware of what's happening and able to respond to that. It's really no, no different to how you do DevSecOps in a typical data center or, or cloud deployment. And actually all of these tools that we have now, along with ideas like GitOps, make it easier to secure your infrastructure. Imagine if this was 20 years ago and everybody was still you know, on traditional data centers, how much harder it would be to secure it if you have to go to a physical data center and be present there to manage your infrastructure. So I think we're in a better situation now than if this had hit 20 years ago. Yeah, I think of, Carla, I think of you and your, uh, you know, think of you and we're talking with customers does this overwhelm them? Is this something that's just too much for them to think about? Are they thinking about, they must be starting to think about if they're industrial type companies, uh, how they protect their various mm -hmm. nodes out in the field, for instance. But now mm -hmm. with this, with this, you know, with the current state that we're in, what is the perspective now? Is it even more heightened? Is it different? Yeah, I mean, there, there is a very high awareness of, of security issues because they can feel the, the pressure, definitely. And also, um, as Sharon mentioned, the extension to the edge is, is also, um, you know, giving considerations and security concerns. And um, I'm not sure they have been solved, but they are um, definitely starting to think about how to secure both the ed edge devices, but um, more importantly, the data on the edge. And I think that's a change that we are seeing that it's... Um, uh, a bigger focus on securing the data and how to ensure that the data is safe. Um, and as it, uh, you know, travels from edge devices into the cloud to the data center. So, so we are seeing these end-to-end um, -end security uh, paradigms emerging that are centered around uh, data more than uh, infrastructure at this stage. Well, wonderful. Well, just to finish things up before we go, I want to ask each of you for... In one minute or less, any thoughts you have about what is emerging now and what we can expect coming out of this moment in time when we all can go back to our physical world, sit in those wonderful cafes in Copenhagen and walk the streets of London and enjoy the 
bountiful outdoors of Louisiana and Baton Rouge. Tell me, John, what is emerging? What can we expect? Is it going to be all the same? I don't think everything will be back to the same as it was, certainly not immediately. But uh, I don't know. I think from a technology standpoint, I don't see that there's a tremendous amount of trends in the cloud native space that are, that are going to be different. I do think that there's going to be a lot more uh, focus on on being prepared for the next outbreak of this or the next similar kind of outbreak that's that's like this. Uh, probably more of a focus on being prepared for uh, mass remote uh, access or remote work source scenarios and video conferencing and so forth. So um, that I think is probably the the much much more likely sort of of change that you might see within IT departments and, and how they budget. I think that, that as we talked about, organizations still need to be able to maintain competitive advantage and and to do things that are innovative that, that attract customers and retain customers and keep their constituents happy. And by and large, today that's about creating great digital experiences and the tools that enable those great digital experiences are largely cloud native tooling. So I, I don't see like the investments in this going down. In fact, quite the contrary. You know, if you're in a situation where you can't sell your physical goods, you know, you want to make sure that you can sell them virtually and that you can reach your customers virtually and Again, utilizing these tool sets and, and these ecosystems are really the best way to do that today. Cloud 2020 and beyond, Cheryl. I think this is a really good reset point for a lot of infrastructure teams, in fact, because they're really rethinking the relationships with the current suppliers that they have and what are the needs of the organization to respond quickly to this kind of situation. And I see open source as becoming, I, I would argue it already is, but perhaps even more becoming just the de facto way to build infrastructure. And that's why coming back to what I was saying at the beginning about this survey we did, that it's not important not only to be using these open source projects, but to also be back in the community and contributing back to each other and sharing what we've learned. And that way we'll all be better after this is finished. Leaving it with you, Carla. Take us out. <laughs> sure. No, um, I agree that uh, I think the new normal that uh, that we will be in is uh, is going to be much more um, cloud enabled and and cloud native than we are seeing today. Um, I also think that. Um, a lot of the innovation that we will see to create these uh, better customer experiences or immersive customer experiences will be built on the cloud and will come from the cloud. Um, and uh, and so for me, um, this is really the, um, the turning point where a lot of the concerns that we've seen, especially in Europe around cloud adoption are subsiding and, uh, and the road is clear for, for greater cloud adoption. We'll leave it at that. This turning point that we face, I like what John had to say about people and processes, how they're, that's critical. And I believe Carla supported that and Cheryl's views on how the open source communities are emerging and evolving and becoming more important than ever are all great themes for us to think about. I wanna thank Prisma by Palo Alto Networks, Prisma Cloud by Palo Alto Networks. Thank you so much for sponsoring our show. I want to thank our guests today. You were terrific. John Morello of Palo Alto Networks, of, the, of CNCF, and Carla Aron of IDC. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back again soon. Have a great day and Stay safe out there. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Thank you.